Edge computing. I guess it would be good to know if um, if we are any nearer a definitive definition, or at least if Dell has a definition, you know, which it uses when it's discussing this topic. Well, um, edge computing. It's interesting that there are, as you say, lots of different definitions. When I think about edge computing, I'm thinking mainly of a combination of two things. One is what is the device that's at the edge. And secondly, what's the workload that it's running? Uh, so um, certainly from our point of view, I wouldn't classify a user device such as a mobile phone as an edge device or a, um, a PC as an edge device, unless, for example, the PC was a very particular type of PC that's hardened into an edge gateway, for example, and is being used to run workloads um, at the edge, not specifically for one user. So I think that that's an important part of the definition. I also think that there's, um, you know, we're looking for certain capabilities of edge computing devices, like the ability to manage them remotely, to control it remotely, probably to have some kind of out of band management available as well. Um, and it's a lot of the, a lot of the principles that have been honed over the years in the cloud or in the public cloud, um, now being used to control and manage those devices at the edge. So if that's in scope, then I'd say that's a, it's a pretty good definition for um, edge computing. Okay, and in terms of what has been achieved so far, because again, it's, I guess, like a lot of these pipes, like I can think back to virtualization and everyone talked about it and sort of nothing happened for a little while and then it's suddenly, you know, all, all hell broke loose. If you like. With edge, people have talked about it for a while and maybe bear in mind what you talked about, the definition 5G isn't the, you know, the key enabler, I don't know, but just what, what's been done with the edge so far? Um, well, I think there's always, there's always been a recognition for, for many years that people have wanted to move computing to the edge, but there have been over the years um, various things to, to, to trip people over, I guess, which might be around uh, bandwidth or latency or the ability to shrink a capability down to a manageable size so it can be carousel at the edge um, or uh, the ability to put something in a hostile environment or perhaps consider something which doesn't have the network um, capabilities of a data center location and is not in a, um, a hugely secure location surrounded by feet of concrete you know there's a um, there, there are lots of considerations that come into that I think people have started out with smart devices and the IOT type approach um, and that makes sense but I think there comes a crossover point where you have a certain amount of capability required or you've got a certain number of devices where I think you then have to say I need um, a coherent approach to delivering edge computing it can't just be a case of I'll have this set of scales over here in a factory which happens to be smart enabled or I'll have this air monitoring system that happens to have a USB connection on the back. I think we we at the stage where we're thinking about not only how can you kept, capture the data, but then how can you manage it? How do you keep it secure? How do you process it at the edge um, and how do you grow it? So these are these are some of the key concepts which I think people are, are facing at the moment. Um, but the good news is that you know, there are so many changes recently that we've been able to um, make huge inroads. And I think another thing that's changed recently is the, uh, the global uh, effect of pricing of energy. You know, and these are um, driving, these kind of considerations are driving people to make certain new uh, decisions at the edge where previously they, they may have had that as a second priority. I think edge is, the, the, is increasing in its uh, priority now for lots of organizations. Okay, so um, if I sort of slightly rephrase the question, I mean, are we still in the infancy stage? Is there still a lot more to come from the edge? Um, and maybe to my own, but is there a, can you see a killer? I mean, a lot of people talk about the uh, autonomous vehicles, for example, as being the, you know, the killer edge app as and when they, they, you know, they arrive. Is, is that what we're waiting for? Or are people making good progress without worrying too much as to whether there's some you know, amazing application that's going to, you know, change the way they do their business or whatever. Uh, well, it's interesting you, you raise the topic of AI because I think that AI is, um, is something where organizations are, are not 
benefiting as much from it as they could be. I think the, the technology is there for them to be able to consume it, but the difficulty is how do those businesses put it in the context of what they do, like what they manage or what their service is or what they're trying to sell. Um, and so from my point of view, I think the, the, the technology is there today um, to be able to implement those kind of solutions, but you have to think about your business and your key processes in a slightly different way to take advantage of it. Um, and that also then changes the way you design these kind of approaches. So, for example, I don't think you need to necessarily wait for AI to be in uh, self-driving cars to take advantage of that. But I do think you have to think carefully of where do you want the AI processing to take place? Do you want it to take place in a multi-cloud environment where there's some linkage back to your data centers or back to a public cloud data center? Do you want all of the AI decisions to be happening in, in edge devices? What's the implication of where the data sits that you collect and then process? So there are some key design decisions to be made. And I think that might be something that organizations need to need to get their head around. Um, but again, it, it's like you described, it's a it's a phased approach. We know that having zero edge is not the right answer. Having everything at the edge is probably not the right answer today. But how do you what are the stepping stones to get there? So I think the organizations have to lay that path down so that they can say, OK, Phase one, this, phase two, that, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and in terms of, I mean, however the edge is developed over time, um, intuitively one imagines that by adding a lot more local or decentralized IT infrastructure, we are going to be potentially um, adding to the sustainability challenge rather than taking away from them. Or is that a simplistic view, bearing in mind that um, you know, as with what we're doing today, for example, we might otherwise have had to travel a long distance, meet up, etc. So, is that IT also part of the solution? And and how do you kind of balance those you know those two angles, if, if that makes sense? Um, well, it's an interesting point of view in that yes, we are looking to add IT into um, more locations where it's not there today, but I think the net effect of that will be a reduction in the impact on, on the environment. And there, there are a couple of reasons why I say that. The first one is that if organizations are having uh, server and storage equipment, which is more than three years old, which they, um, which they haven't kept up to date or they haven't refreshed in some way, then what those organizations are finding is that if they were to replace that with modern compute and modern storage, they could make such a huge saving on their electricity bill that actually that's enough of a saving on a monthly basis to pay for um, replacement new IT, which is actually going to be more efficient than that, uh, than what they have today. It's almost like finding a way to unlock free money because you know that at the end of the month, you're going to get that electricity bill and that absolutely has to be paid. There's no way out of that. So that's real OPEX going out of the organization. If you can consume your IT on an OPEX basis for uh, data centers or for public cloud or at the edge, then in that kind of scenario, um, you can take the actual real world savings on a monthly basis and use that to fund uh, growth at the edge in a much more efficient way. So that's the first, that's the first area. And the second area is, I think there is a, um, a huge pressure on organizations and a lot of it is a kind of self-imposed pressure or pressure from their customers that says, when you put these solutions into an edge location, make sure, um, that the impact on sustainability is really obvious and, and profound. So for example, let's say you've got a manufacturing site where there's a furnace, which is gas fired furnace, or maybe you've got um, a pottery site, which has an electric kiln, or maybe you've got restaurants, which have ovens, which are on all day. You've got two choices. You could take that kiln or that oven or that refrigerator, and you could throw it out even though it's 10 years old and has been working fine for the last 10 years, and you could buy a brand new one that's completely smart and engineered to be smart from the ground up. Or you could take an edge device and integrate it with that 10 year old oven or kiln or whatever, and use it to improve the energy efficiency of that device. Okay, so you would have bought some IT to do that. But the net effect is, it would be like, for example, somebody coming into the factory at nine o'clock, they turn on the gas supply to heat up the uh, the kiln the kiln gets hot over the next half an hour the maybe the metal isn't or the pottery isn't ready to go in the kiln at that point so it comes to 10 o'clock and nothing's been put in the kiln but the thing's been running for an hour already are you really going to pay somebody to turn the gas supply up and down to adjust and try and work out when they need the most efficient uh, usage of that energy 
or does it make sense to um, connect up uh, an edge gateway device which can monitor that constantly and then have a mechanism where it can adjust uh, the the electricity or the gas or you know what are the whatever the energy consumption is and you might say well how do i know how to adjust that and the answer is well this is when you start to take advantage of predictive analytics like an ai type solution which will say well i can see what orders are coming up i can see how the production line is going i think i'm going to turn down the temperature by 10 percent because i know it's not going to be required for another half hour or i'll boost it up by another 20 percent because i know there's a huge batch about to be put in the oven right so those kind of scenarios I think organizations are focusing on those kind of things first because they know that the impact of changing their energy usage is not only a good thing to do for the sustainability point of view, but it's going to be a massive impact on their costs. Okay, and in terms of the, the your your customers that are, are, are doing that, I mean, would you say the majority have sort of worked this out and are, are therefore doing things, or are some of them still struggling with the approach you described earlier as to whether to rip or replace or, you know, to... To, as you say, use smart technology. Um, are you able to sort of characterize your customer base on the way? And I don't know, maybe even share an example or two of, of things that folks might be up to. Um, I think it varies by industry. I think in general, it's probably fair to say that um, there's a lot of scope to improve things in, in some of the manufacturing areas, because historically, those environments have been uh, the complete opposite of what you get in the data center. Are they full of humidity or they're full of sparks flying around or there's lots of dust or there's lots of static. Um, and now that you've got hardened devices that you can literally bolt to the wall in those places and they still keep running because they don't have any holes for air to go in and out of or they don't have any fans. Um, you, it's much easier and more practical to get compute into those, those kind of locations. Um, if you look at retail, for example, retail have had um edge locations for a number of years so it could be a large supermarket that has a whole fleet or swarm if you like of cameras in the ceiling you know in those kind of scenarios um the organizations are quite used to remotely running and operating things the the change that's now happened is what's the most efficient way of doing that so previously for example um if you wanted to take your Azure capability and have some of your Azure processing running in a supermarket, you'd probably have to start off with a three node cluster that would do that kind of processing for you. But nowadays in the modern solution, you can start with as small as like a one node cluster in one supermarket and then manage it, run and operate it from a cloud like Azure. But when you choose to deploy something in the drop down, you could choose an Azure region, but you'll have a new, a new area that will come up in your drop down that says something like, supermarket 257 right so so these kind of um approaches i think they vary by industry vertical um and it would seem to me that you know retail is fairly fairly ahead of the game in terms of looking for ways to optimize cost and i think on this in broad brush strokes you know manufacturing has got a lot of opportunity to, to make improvements. The other thing I think about manufacturing, which is slightly different, is that there seems to be more of an appetite um, to go all in for heavily customized solutions. So if you're trying to optimize um, a manufacturing line, there are going to be some use cases which are so specific that you could develop custom solutions for those. And instead of just um, writing it as some software that you put in a um, a Kubernetes container or that kind of thing, you could actually, in that case, embed that in the silicon. And so the, the idea that, that I think is particularly interesting is when you consume something on demand from us, you might say, well, I'll have this device as a service. I'm only paying for what I use on a monthly basis. It gets shipped to the, uh, the factory where it's going to be used. Someone bolts it to the wall. Um, when you plug it into the network, it already knows what role it's going to be doing. So it comes to life in a secure way and builds up all the software that it needs. And then at that point, it, it works out that with the addition of plugging in a little uh, chip or a little motherboard, um, you can actually embed in silicon a very specific use case. And in, in that particular case, as soon as the customer does that, what they've actually done is they've differentiated themselves against their competition because probably their competition is trying to upload all of their data into a data center somewhere and process it there in a database. Or maybe they've worked out how to put it into a container, but that container is running you know, somewhere else. Very few of them have gone to the stage where they've actually embedded that capability in the silicon 
And I think that ultimately is now that we've now that things like car manufacturers are doing that as a as a normal day by day thing, I think that really opens the doors for um, other manufacturing type organisations to do something similar. And and clearly, when people are making these decisions, that um, the commercial aspect is is I guess the still the main driver. But I'm just wondering, with the sustainability angle, is that sort of becoming more and more part of the conversation so when people are coming to you for a solution um you know, relating to the to the edge are they clearly they want it to work well save the money make things more fashion whatever those but are they also sort of querying on the sustainability side or saying it needs to also you know help us oh yes absolutely re reduce our carbon footprint or, or whatever however they put it yeah definitely i mean there are um <clears throat> approaches where they can work with the manufacturer for example to help offset carbon there are approaches where um they come along and say we've got all this legacy kit what can we do about that so one of the things for example we'll look at is we'll buy the legacy kit off them and then use the value of that mm -hmm. as a credit um we look at uh recycling you know, for the customer to, to help. So, so they don't have to worry about things which are not core to their business. What we can do is we can get involved and say, look, we know how to securely destroy data. We know how to recycle these computer components. We'll take that into consideration as we build a business case. And what we also do is um, previously, business cases for companies would be generic things which are broad brush approaches to say, you make this change and you can expect X percent savings. What we what we now do on a case by case basis is to look at the specific use case of the specific customer and create a business case individually for that. And um, that's only um, relatively recently become a, a straightforward thing to do because there's now data on the consumption of pretty much any technical device you can imagine. Um, and so if you say, I've got this technical device It's running at 80% utilization, then we can make a prediction about how much energy that thing's using. Um, and then we can work out what the difference is going to be between that and a more modern solution and then convert that into CO2 saved or to uh, electricity cost savings or that kind of thing. So those, I think that it's become Previously, it was something where customers would come along and say, well, this is a nice thing to have and we, we think it's the right thing to do. But now it's a question of, yes, all of the above, plus we want a detailed business case that, that justifies it. And I think people have been pleasantly surprised now by the impact they can have by being more sustainable, basically, to their costs. Okay. And in terms of Dell yourselves, I mean, I, I know because I've followed the storage industry, data center industry for quite a number of years, I know um, the IT manufacturers, the the I mean, PUE is the metric used in the data center, and the one is the given of the IT and the data center folks. No, they're not aggressive, but they say we've done pretty well on the PUE. But the ones, you know, the down to the IT. So, what measures are you are, are you taking, you know, to to make servers storage more efficient? And I'm wondering, I'm um, again, I'm not sort of overly familiar, but things like photonics, uh, I believe, might have a role to play in the future. So. What's yeah? What what developments are, are Dell and maybe others looking at in terms of improving the the energy efficiency of, of you know, hardware? Um, well, I suppose one of the most obvious things is um, the power consumed by the central processing chips if they're Intel or AMD. So using the latest generation has an absolutely massive impact. Um, so that's one of the first things to look at. And then internally, we've got more efficient ways of laying out the devices to uh, manage airflow, or in the case of an edge environment, to eliminate airflow altogether and still have sufficient passive cooling. Um, we are looking at the materials that are used in the end-to-end -end manufacturing and, of course, uh, in the packaging as well. Uh, but going forward, one of the things that I think is a massive focus is actually reducing the amount of compute and storage that's required so let's say for example um you know you want to optimize uh, performance of oracle databases right oracle databases you might think well all i need to do is improve the uh, increase in the amount of cpu but it turns out in a lot of these use cases you can have a, a much bigger um, uh, performance improvement of a database by improving the speed of the storage which the database is using and by improving the speed of the storage, it means you can actually reduce the number of CPUs that are required to process data in the same database with a similar workload. 
Um, so how do you improve the capabilities of the storage in terms of the I.O. throughput and the processing required? Well, what we do is we deploy artificial intelligence to look at the, um, the use of those storage technologies and try to do things like predict when to move certain data into a cache or predict when to move data down to a cooler tier or um, we will pre-process the data into vectors. So instead of storing all the raw data, if you know that you're going to use this data to be analyzed in a particular way, what we can do is pre-process the data within the storage array such that it produces these vectors and the vectors are then it's the only component that this compute needs to actually read. And that, in that way, it hasn't actually read 100% of the data, it's read like 10% of the data. Or we can look at um, um, producing large models which aren't an exact representation of the data, but it's a good good enough prediction of the data for what you want to use. And, you know, in the press at the moment, large language models have, became, have become extremely trendy and everyone's raving about uh, the use of these um, in transformers and that kind of thing. So, you know, the um, it's interesting what you see outside of the environment, but what's not what's not always so obvious is what we're doing behind the scenes to take advantage of these technologies in our products um, in terms of the way we make them more efficient or we um, adopt artificial intelligence. Uh, another example of this is um, looking at the efficiency of how you consume public cloud type solutions. So uh, one of the things that we make available is a lot of our technology solutions are now available as software versions and those software versions are optimized to run in public clouds. So you could go to a public cloud provider like AWS or someone and say, I need um, 10,000 VMs and it, uh, I need this amount of storage to accompany these VMs and we need a, the best price for that, which is great. But if you compare the cost per VM for 10,000 VMs versus like 10 VMs for a small company, you might think, well, there's economies of scale, but at some point there comes a crossover point between 10 up to 1,000 VMs or 10,000 VMs. Somewhere in that continuity, there's a point where it doesn't make sense to run that kind of configuration in a pure public cloud. But what you can do is you can create a multi-cloud solution where we use our software, which has been optimizing on-premise solutions for ages to actually optimize what you've got in the cloud. So for example, it would take advantage of um, uh, local storage, which is in those VMs on AWS machines, and it'll say, well, these VMs aren't being used for anything. These, these, the storage is not being used for anything because someone's attached it to S3 storage, for example. But the actual storage that you get from a, just the nature of having a VM in AWS means you get some storage with every VM. So we can take that storage, which is presently being unused, and using our software, we present a piece of that storage to every VM in the organization. So now 10,000 VMs, are, it's as if they've all got 10,000 hard disks. With our kind of solution, what that means is you can distribute the compute and the storage in a way more efficient manner across the public cloud and across the edge and across your, your data centers. And the economies of scale then become um, incredible. And not only the economies of scale in terms of cost are improved, but the performance um, is absolutely massively improved as well. So these kind of solutions, I think the is that this is one of the key concepts is, is to look at, as I scale my approach, how can I to get the best out of public cloud versus on-premise versus edge? And when I get to a particular threshold, how do I decide when to overlay particular software solutions on top, which make the whole solution more efficient? And if you get it just right, if you get that balance just right, you'll optimize those three areas, the public cloud, the on-premise cloud, and the, the edge location. Okay, so optimization, it sounds like it's all, you're already underway with that. It, it's a, a, a massive potential to, to help address the issue. Um, at some stage, will newer technology, again, maybe I'm thinking, I, I know at the moment quantum computing is, is very much in its sort of a infancy, but as a, you know, in the same way that high high performance computing, I guess, was once the realm of academics, but now that's become more, you know, sort of enterprise. Well, not fit, but yeah, it's affordable for the enterprise if you like. Do you think things like quantum computing will eventually, you know, become enterprise ready and therefore make another contribution? So I guess what I'm saying is, how far can we go with optimizing existing and, and e evolution, and do we need a 
a revolution at some stage to make a you know, a big difference in terms of efficiency of, of infrastructure. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I'm not sure if the revolution in quantum will become will come fast enough compared to the other revolutions which are which are coming first. You can imagine like these waves crashing onto a beach. The quantum wave is kind of a huge, slow moving wave, and the <laughs> the other waves are smaller waves, but they're hitting the beach like ten times a second. So <laughs> I think that's a, an interesting situation because today you can use um if you had to take like a 16g server for example the amount of processing that you can do on that is enough for you to be able to use a quantum simulation so you would be able to start developing use cases or start thinking about where could uh, quantum solutions improve your your business activities and by doing that then you've got to realize well who's going to be responsible for it who's going to design it how would you support it how would you run and operate it how do you get the results out of it how do you integrate a quantum solution to a non-quantum solution because the non-quantum solutions are not going away anytime soon these kind of problems you can start to work on now with the quantum simulators um, even if um, access to quantum computing is not available and there are other things that we can do to prepare for it as well such as think about um, what algorithms are safe to use for things like cryptography and other calculations that you'd want to do. So how can you make sure that when that wave does land on the beach at some point that you're completely optimized to take advantage of it? Um, and it's interesting because the most forward looking organizations, they already, they, they have like quarterly reviews of new technology and new approaches which are coming out and they will adjust their course correct their te technical strategy but m that's a very small number of cu uh, customers who do that i'd say i think the majority of the customers wait for one of these waves to land and then they're in full-on react mode and the, the race is to say who can react to it the quickest so for example you know how many people are taking advantage of chat gpt in bing at the moment um probably a small number and the small number are wondering why but the, then you say, well, how many of those companies would be affected by a technology like that? And the answer is probably nearly all of the companies will be affected. This is not just a small um, niche solution, right? So um, the next thing is that these, as these waves come in and land on the beach, they don't just land and dissipate. They kind of stack up on top of each other. And we saw this with other technologies in the past. So if you look at technologies like... Uh, in the storage world, for example, um, there was no compression originally, and then compression was added on. And then after compression, we started talking about, well, what about um, uh, dedupe? And then dedupe on top of compression, and then you've got variable block length dedupe, and then after that, you've got all the way up to um, the latest cloud approaches that you would take to managing data, which you can now use in a, in a data center. But the problem that customers have got is that if you, if you skip one of these waves, or if you skip one of these steps, you're actually like putting a wall in front of yourself, which is blocking you from getting to all the other technologies on the other side of that wall. So there's no point, for example, us putting forward a solution that optimizes your variable length block dedupe if you haven't got any software that can take advantage of dedupe in the first place. You know, and I think that some some customers haven't yet realized that the adoption of these IT things has to be lots of small incremental changes. No one is really expecting them to take a huge leap and just wipe out all of their IT and replace it with something else overnight. I think there has to be a constant um, evolution of that. And the most successful companies, I think, have, have, have tuned themselves into that way of thinking. And what they don't do is they don't say, oh, well, in two years time, I'll have a brand new sales system that's going to cost millions and it's going to replace what we've got today. They never they don't say things like that. What they say is we were going to review it on a month by month, quarter by quarter basis, and we're going to adjust as we go through. So yeah, these are quantum computing is interesting, but yes, let's see what other waves are coming at the same time and how they're going to stack on top of each other and what the impact will be. Okay, um, I really appreciate the time. And maybe just as as we conclude back to the original um, I guess, focus, which was the edge computing. Uh, how do you see the potential, I mean, but what, you know, as you said, with chat GPT, you know, virtually every business will find it, you know, it's of some relevance. Do you think that's the same potential with edge computing? Virtually everyone will realize that bringing some IT resources closer to where it might be used um, away from, you know, the centralized approach 
will make complete sense for them or will it sort of over time people work out what's sensible what's not so it won't be as mainstream I'd just just your thoughts as to you know where we might finish with it i think there'll be a realization at some point depending on the industry that they'll absolutely have to have an edge solution and it would be like going into a restaurant that doesn't have enough tables you know that would be a crazy thing to do if you don't have an edge solution you know for your organization that, that would also in, in the future seem like a, a crazy thing to do and i think that um we're talking about these waves stacking on top of each other at the moment everything with uh things like chat gpt is centralized but if you look at a lot of the uh the generative ai that's coming up models which had billions of connections previously have been shrunk by a factor of 10 in the, in the space of a few months you know the processing required therefore to run them is getting smaller and smaller and so with this kind of contraction going down, you're more and more is now becoming available. It's like a kind of the marketplace for edge devices or all the things you could run on the edge is expanding like the App Store expanded for, for Apple. You know, there's a, um, every time a new one of these use cases comes out, in order to monetize one of those use cases, all you really have to do is pick a small subset of it and be very good at delivering that subset. So I think one of the, um, one of the most, popular um, iPhone apps at the moment is an app. I think it's called Lenza or something like that. But basically what it does is you input 10 images and it refactors those 10 images into a hundred different art styles. Well, all that's doing is using one particular small capability of a, a generative AI, which, which creates images. Okay. But it can do that same AI could create PowerPoint slide decks, it could create artworks, it could create schematics, it could create report designs, it could create websites. But all the company has done is they've monetized one very small part of that. So that one wave has now spanned out all these other use cases, which are in themselves generating uh, revenue. So I think that that kind of change that we see in the consumer way, in the back end, that will be happening in industry for their edge locations. You, they will be picking key use cases which have been enabled by these waves that have come in and hit the beach and taking them and embedding them into the silicon or even into the, or just in the software of these edge devices. So we've got all of that to look forward to, all of that to come. It's just a question of, you know, when are organizations going to push the button and do they, when are they going to realize that um, they've got this kind of pressure behind them, which is pushing them towards this kind of goal in, in a nice way. Okay, well, it's been great to chat. I mean, we covered a lot of ground and really appreciate your insights. So Elliot, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.